Good morning, class, and uh, we're glad to have all of you here this morning. I believe that uh, we have 37, 37 here this morning, and then we certainly miss the ones that's not uh, being able to attend with us yet, and hope you'll soon be able to be back with us. Um, we're still studying in the book of uh, Luke. Uh, we're still in the chapter 22, as we were last week. Uh, we were studied 7 through 12, I believe it was last week, and today we go uh, fast forward and over to uh, verse 41 through 53. Today's scripture is about, it was after the Passover meal that the Lord's and the Lord's Supper had been completed. Jesus at this time led his disciples from the upper room where they had met to observe the uh, Passover meal and the Lord's Supper. You remember last week we studied that uh, Jesus sent Peter and John out to prepare to find a place, and uh, this already was made though, but to prepare the upper room and to prepare the unleavened bread meal for the Passover. Jesus and his disciples crossed the Kidron Valley to the Mount of Olives. This is where the Garden of Gethsemane was located. That's always been a special place in my heart, the Garden of Gethsemane. Uh, I'll, probably, I'll never get to go to the, uh, that foreign country, but uh, it's always seemed like a special place in my heart every time I hear about the Garden of Gethsemane because that's where Jesus prayed so much. Here Jesus left the disciples and told them to pray so they would not come into temptation. Jesus then went a little farther so he could be alone with his heavenly father. Jesus would talk to his heavenly father about the upcoming fulfillment of the cup he wanted to talk with him about. Now this brings us up to today's scripture. Starting in verse 41, it says, Then he withdrew from them about a stone's throw, knelt down, and began to pray. Now on this night before the crucifixion, Jesus wanted to spend time in prayer with his father. The Garden of Gethsemane was a walled garden. I can just picture that just... Uh, a special place where the walls were just lined possibly with with uh, all kind of vegetation. I'm sure it was a beautiful place. After Jesus and his disciples arrived at the garden, Jesus told eight of the disciples to remain at the place where they arrived. Then he took Peter, James, and John, and he went further into the garden. Then he left them and moved forward to be alone with his heavenly father to pray. He knelt down and began to pray. Verse 42 says, Father, if you are willing, take this cup from me. Nevertheless, not my will, but yours be done. What a great, what a great attitude. If we only have that attitude in our daily life, our walk with Jesus would be a lot closer. This request involved more than just taking the cup. It involved Jesus going to the cross and suffering. But most importantly, it represented Jesus taking on the sins of the whole world and dying for them. Dying for us. Jesus asked the Father, if there was another way, rather than to take this cup, but in the same breath, he said, nevertheless, not my will, but yours be done. This statement says it all. Jesus is willing to take on the sins of of the whole world, he was going to be tried. He was going to be beaten. 
and crucified. But most importantly, he was doing the will of the Father. That is our, should be our prayer and our goal every day is to do the will of our Heavenly Father. Verse 43, he said, Then an angel from heaven appeared to him, strengthened him. You know, God always has a way of comforting his children. He sent an angel down to strengthen Jesus at a time that he was in a lot of mental anguish and turmoil. Verse 44 says, Being in anguish, he prayed more fervently, fervently, and his sweat became drops of blood falling to the ground. Can you imagine that? To be in so much turmoil and anguish that drops, his sweat became drops of blood. I can't imagine how what stress Jesus was under. The time had come. The time had come for the great plan of salvation now to be in process. Jesus had come to, and prayed to his father. If there's a way. But God told him. This is the way. And Jesus now is willing, as has always been willing to go ahead with the process of the process of salvation. So each one of us can reap the benefits. Without this process, where will we be? We'd be lost as a fish in the sea. Verse 45. When he got up from prayer and came to his disciples, he found them sleeping, exhausted from their grief. When Jesus finished his request and prayed to his heavenly Father, he had received the answer to his request about the cup. And now to move ahead with a great plan of salvation, he got up and returned where he had left his disciples. No doubt they were exhausted from all the grief that they had suffered. They had been dealing with the things that Jesus had been informing them down through the days, his latter days. He had told them that he was going to be suffered he was going to suffer and had to die. But you know, they were dealing with that also. So they were in grief also. Once again, the disciples could not fully understand all the things that Jesus had been telling them. Verse 46. Why are you sleeping? He asked them. Get up and pray so that you won't fall into temptation after Jesus awoke after Jesus awoke the disciples from sleeping he asked why are you sleeping he said get up and pray but the thing Jesus was not asking them to to pray for him he didn't say pray for me he was saying so you will not fall into temptation Jesus knew that the mob, when the mob would arise, arrive, let me get that word, arrive to arrest him, there'd be a time of temptation that they'd want to resist. They'd want to resist this arrest because they were so protective and loved Jesus so much. Verse 47 says, when, while they were still speaking, suddenly a mob came and one of the twelve named Judas was leading them. <clears throat> he came near Jesus to kiss him. While Jesus was still speaking to the disciples, the mob, as we read there, was led by Judas. This betrayal by Judas started before the garden, before they got to the garden of Gethsemane. If you look over in and I'll read this. If you look over in uh, Matthew 24 and 16, 14 through 16, it says, One of the twelve, the one called Judas, 
went to the chief priest and asked, What are you willing to give me if I hand over to you? So they counted out him 30 silver coins. From then on, Jesus watched for an opportunity to hand Jesus over. So he had planned on this. And now the opportunity came that Judas was going to hand Jesus over for 30 pieces of silver. The mob included Judas, the chief priest and the elders, also the temple guards, and because the temple guards were in, uh, were in charge then, but they, because the Romans had not been involved in it at this time, the mob was led by Judas. Judas had shared the experience of, of the past preaching and healing. Can you imagine? A man that Jesus had given the power to heal and to preach and to teach. And then he turned around and betrayed Jesus. In spite of this privileged role, Judas still turned his back upon the greatest man that ever walked on this earth. His greed for money had overcome common sense. And being led by the devil, he now portrayed the Son of God and doomed his soul. Matthew 26 and 24 says, It would have been better if this man had never been born been better off if, if Judas had never been born. Verse 48 says, But Jesus said to him, Judas, are you betraying the Son of Man with a kiss? When Judas and their mob and the mob arrived, Judas betrayed Jesus with a kiss, just as Jesus had stated. This statement from Jesus probably struck Judas like a dagger in the heart. You think about it. All the times that they had spent together. Judas had to think about the times he had walked with Jesus. How Jesus gave him the power to heal and minister to others. And the thought probably hit him that now he had become a minister for the devil. A worker for the devil instead of of a minister for Jesus Christ. You know, later after this trial, Judas had such deep remorse, he went back to the priests and the elders. And once again, Matthew 27 said, when Judas saw that Jesus was condemned to death, he was seized with remorse. Can you imagine what came over him when he realized what was going to take place, and returned the 30 coins to the chief priests and the elders. When they disregarded him, he threw the money into the temple, left, and went away and hanged himself. Judas took his own life, but this was not the end of Judas. It was not over. Now, Judas had to face God for judgment. And that was the bad part about it. Verse 49. When those around him saw what was going to happen, they asked, Lord, shall we strike with a sword? The 11 disciples saw what was going to happen and asked Jesus, should they, depend, should they defend him? While in the upper room, Jesus spoke about obtaining swords. This is found in Luke 22, 35 through 38. And real quickly, we'll go over that. The conversation. Then Jesus asked them, When I sent you out with a purse, without a purse, a bag, and sandals, did you lack anything? The disciples says, Nothing, they answered. Then Jesus said, He said to them, but now if you have a purse, take it and also a bag 
And if you don't have a sword, sell your cloak and buy one. It is written, and he was numbered with the transgressors. And I tell you that this must be fulfilled in me. Yes, what is written about me is reaching the fulfillment. The disciples said, See, Lord, here we have two swords. Jesus said, That's enough, he replied. Oh, bear with me. I think I've shuffled my sheets there. Verse 50. says, Then one of them struck the high priest's servant and cut off his right ear. Luke did not specify which disciple struck with a sword. But the, John's gospel revealed that it was Peter. Peter did not wait to, to hear the answer about should we defend you, Jesus? He didn't wait for that answer. Peter took the sword and whacked off the ear of the priest. Instead, of, he, uh, instead he swacked off the ear of the priest. Then verse 51 says, but Jesus responded, no more of this. Jesus was a man of peace. He didn't want any more turmoil to go on. And touching his ear, he healed him. Jesus resp responded to Peter, saying, no more of this. Jesus then took the action and touched the high priest's ear, and he was healed. You think about it. No doubt there was a calmness over the whole, I would guess there was a calmness over the whole party there. When Jesus reached up and touched the ear of the priest and they saw, bingo. When Jesus did the healing, what did the mob think? What was, it, what was running through the high priest and the mob's mind when they saw this healing? The man they had came to arrest and later crucify had now performed a miracle right before their eyes. Don't you imagine that woke up some people? Verse 52 says, Then Jesus said to the chief priest, The temple police and the elders who had come for him, have you come with swords and clubs as if I was a criminal? Jesus confronted a mob with this question. They had, had come like they had come for to arrive for battle or to put down an uprising. Jesus was asking why they come as if he was a criminal. No doubt this was an overkill for this event because Jesus was going peacefully anyway because it was a plan of God. It was a plan of salvation. It was God's plan. And he had already prayed to, to God and God had given him to go ahead with it. Verse 53, Jesus said, Every day while I was with you in the temple, you never laid a hand on me, but this is your hour and the dominion of darkness. Jesus said all the times that you had a chance to arrest me and you never laid a hand on me, but he said, this is the hour. This is the hour that had been planned. This is part of God's plan. The hour had arrived, which was the appointed time when the forces of evil were to prevail. Satan had plotted against Jesus all the way from the beginning of time. He had plotted when Jesus came on this earth that he was going to get rid of him. Although without Jesus' willingness, Satan could do nothing. It's just like today, Satan could do nothing if we keep prayed up. Jesus could have called 10,000 angels to resolve this whole arrest. To save him from the rest in the upcoming events. But he was so graciously 
prayed to his father in the garden of Gethsemane the, the night of his arrest, praying, not my will, but thine be done. So God's will was now being carried out. In closing, I read one commentary said, Satan may have thought he was destroying God's plan through Judas, but the results show just how important and impossible that is. Judas reminds us that God is always in control. Judas's name itself, let God be praised, is a reminder that even the worst of situations can be used by God in a powerful way. That's my thoughts on 41 through 53. Let's pray. Father God, we thank you for your word. Lord, we thank you for the plan of salvation. God, we thank you so much for Jesus so willingly to accept the cup, the beating, the crucifixion, and so glorious, dear God, that the resurrection, which we all now have the opportunity, Lord, and looking so forward to one day to spend a day, spend the time in heaven with you, Lord. For God, your plan of salvation was fulfilled through this terrible time. But such a great thing came from this terrible time that Jesus had to suffer through. Lord, we thank you for loving us. We thank you for being in our presence this morning. You see in your word, we're two or three gathered together. You'll be in your presence, Lord. And we are here for you, dear God. We're not here for us. We're here to draw from each other through the presence of God. All these things, God, we ask in your precious name and for our sake. Amen.